The speech yeah. uh, for those uh, uninitiated, the speech tape being the speech tapes are. Buddy Rich was a uh, had a very volatile personality, shall we say, and and he uh, he would take out his frustrations on the members of the ensemble on a fairly regular basis, and uh, anybody who's been or been in the band or or been around it experienced it uh, pretty regularly. And at any rate, at one point, Lee Musiker, who was the piano player then, and he's now Tony Bennett's musical director, Lee uh, decided, Lee was always taping every show um, to, for his playing, and he wanted to get better. He's a really, very passionate guy, an amazing musician, and was constantly wanting to get better. And uh, so he always had his, back then, it were those big pro Walkmans, and they were like, you know, they, were, they looked, back then we thought they were so slick, coming from what, they, what was before that, but at any rate, Lee would, tape it and then and invariably buddy would be bugged about something and he calls either onto the bus or into the dressing room and just scream at us for 10 minutes i mean like you can't believe you know and uh so lee would just start taping him because he always had his tape recorder with him so buddy never thought anything of it because he always saw him with his tape recorder so anyway these speech tapes lee made him i think there was a total of three speeches um over the course of six to eight months or so and what's funny is that uh, Lee recently blamed me in a Jazz Times article for letting the speech tapes out, which I thought was funny because I left to go on Woody Herman's band. And, um, and I said to Lee, you know, I, I, you know, I, get, I gotta get a copy of that before I leave. And he's like, okay, well make sure you don't give it out to anybody. Which, you know, that's like impossible, you know? Uh, we, we felt we did a really good job. We didn't hear much for a couple of weeks and we were really nervous. And then they said, you know, come back up. And, and they, their sax player, Bobby Keys, who's been with them since the late 60s, and he played, in fact, played the original saxophone solo on Brown Sugar, and he's been with them ever since. So th at the first audition we took, uh, Bobby wasn't there. So they wanted us to, to play with Bobby and, and make sure Bobby was comfortable or with, you know, who, whatever section they decided to pick. So from what I understand, another section was kind of, like, basically had the gig. And we came in, and, and we, felt, we, we played really well. And I, I remember I just happened to walk by at the right time, and Mick walked over to Bobby and said, you know, well, you know, it's come to, you're, you're going to have to make the final decision because we're split on it. And Bobby just said, you know, out of fairness to the band, you got to hire these guys. So then we got the gig right then. So I'm, I always, at the end of every tour, I walk over and give Bobby a hug and say, you know, I just want to thank you again for, <laughs> yeah, for doing the right thing for us, Bobby. <laughs> but uh, it was great. And, and uh it's turned out to be the, the most remarkable gig I, I can imagine. In 1997, I recorded Absolute Trombone with uh, 16 trombone players in New York and in varying combinations. And uh, the only non-New Yorker was Bill Watrous, who uh, happened to be in town the one of the weeks we were recording. So he came by and, and you know played beautifully, of course. But uh, um, it was great, and we had a great time doing it. Steve Ture, Irby Green came in and played, um, Jim Pugh, John Fedshock, Bert Johnson, a bunch. This this a ton of guys, great players. Larry Farrell, George Flynn, Dave Taylor. I'm leaving out a couple. Uh, Robin Eubanks, um, but Conrad Herwig, one of my favorites. God, I can't believe I almost left him out. Um, anyway, if I'm leaving out somebody, I, I apologize. But it was it was a great experience, and everybody came in and played beautifully, and it was really fun. Joe Alessi, I got to remember. That was nice that Joe came in and played on it. Anyway, um, 
it, it turned out to be uh, successful in its own kind of modest way with limited distribution and limited exposure. Um, it kind of gained some traction in the, in the brass world. So uh, it, that was an important, important step as far as the development of hip bone music, my company. To me, that's important. And you, you, it's funny you mentioned the, uh, the look of everything. I, I really appreciate that. And the aesthetic value of the books and the CDs and the website, it's important to me. And I want people to feel like they're at a place that, that this is quality and this is a righteous product and that this, it feels good in your hands. And, you know, it's, it's funny, though. I think, people, I think people notice that and I think it means something. So from a business standpoint, I'm, I think that's a wise move. It's not always the best in terms of the profit and the, the bottom line, but I think down the road, if people have that feeling about your company, that, that, that's, that's a more positive feature than if you're slightly ahead on the bottom line. Um, I don't know, though. You know, some people could argue that very convincingly the other direction. So just a thought. But that's, mm. we've clearly chosen to go with uh, a quality look and a quality design, a quality product.